So I hope you've come with a sense of expectation that God is going to speak, whether you're in the room or or watching online or on your way to Paris, Marty and Leanne. Wouldn't it be nice to say that? Oh, look, just as we make our way to Paris over the next few days, I've never said that before to anybody, uh, but hopefully one day I'll get the chance just to say that. Um, yeah, we just, I just have a sense that the Lord wants to encourage us today, wants to speak to us, and that he's got things in store for us as we open his word uh, together. I want to pick up where we left off last week, and we're talking about these, these moments that you have in life that are almost too beautiful for words. You know, moments where you meet your bride at the um, head of the aisle on your wedding day, or moments when you see your child take their first breath, or or moments where uh, a close friend finally uh, is free of something that's tormented them and struggled them for years, and you, you, you celebrate with them. It's a moment that takes your breath away. And in those moments in life, those those sacred moments, those special moments, those otherworldly moments, you realize actually they're There are love moments, and there are others' moments. The best moments in life actually are moments that involve other people. And immediately after those moments, after your wedding day, after your child is born, after your friend has that breakthrough, you realize, man, I've got all of these hopes and dreams and and desires, and I've kind of got a plan. When I picture, I close my eyes and I picture the life of the ones that I love, I think, man, this is what I want for you. This is what I, I dream for you. It's, it's this for you. And you realize, oh man, that's how God feels about me. That, that God has hopes and dreams for my life. He says in Jeremiah, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. God has hopes and dreams and plans in mind for us, for me, for each of us. And where, where our hopes and dreams for others and God's hopes and dreams for others, our this for you, and here's this for you, where they collide is in prayer. It's when we bring our prayers to God for other people, where we intercede for them, where we give thanks for them. So I want to talk today again, kind of part two, on praying for others. How do you pray for other people so that your prayers, your this for you, becomes conformed and transformed to be like God's this for you. In other words, what we want for our loved ones becomes transformed to be what he wants for our loved ones. That makes sense? Um, Why should we pray for other people? A few reasons. First of all, there's a lot in the Bible about praying for other people, lots of prayers for others. A lot of Paul's teaching is praying for other people. So we should do that. Secondly, um, we already have hopes and dreams for people. We're already thinking about it, so we might as well pray about it. And thirdly, um, confession time, I think our prayer life isn't what it could be. Often I I find my prayers for the ones I love are either really shallow, Lord, thanks for everything, please protect them, please bless them, amen. You know, generic and shallow, or they're actually selfish, like, Lord, please help my children to eat their vegetables without complaining, you know, get their driver's license on the first attempt, right? They're really prayers about us, not about them. So I want to explore today, like we did last week, what would it look like for our prayer life for other people to become deeper and richer as we give thanks and intercede for the ones that we love. So a quick recap of last week, if you uh, weren't here or if you were, quick reminder, we looked at Philippians chapter 1, where Paul prays, uh, he tells them what he prays for them. I've got a little summary here for us. He says, thinking of you makes me happy. You know, every time I think of you, I'm just grateful for God. Uh, Secondly, I pray, uh, I love you like Christ, so I have the affections of Christ for you, so I pray for you. Um, I pray that love may abound in knowledge and depth of insight, that kind of love, and that that kind of love would lead to uh, a life that you would know what is best. That's growth for God's glory. And today I want to look at Colossians chapter 1. So if you have your Bible, we're going to be Colossians chapter 1 verses 3 to 14. It's Paul describing his prayer and then um, telling them what what he prays for them. So Colossians chapter 1 starting in verse 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all, the, all of God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up in heaven and about which 
you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear servant, our fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told you of your love in the Spirit, told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all of the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to the glorious might that, um, that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us out into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. I love that passage. It is amazing. Classic Paul. Paul starts a sentence and the sentence goes for the whole, whole paragraph. And it's like, let's just add another comma. You know? It's really funny when you translate it. You're like, wait a second. This starts up in verse 3 and it goes the whole way down. to go to verse, uh, verse 12 and then he does a full stop and starts a new sentence. But what you see here is, is Paul describes why he's thankful the pattern often in Paul's prayers is thankfulness leads to intercession. He's thankful for them, and then that transforms and transfers across into intercession for them. And he gives us a big long list of the things that he's thankful for. So this can help shape our prayers as we pray. Paul is thankful and joyful when he remembers them. Every time they come to mind, he's like, man, thank you, Lord. It makes me happy when I think about them. He's thankful because they've accepted the gospel and that's affected how they love one another. Isn't that powerful? They accept the gospel and it transforms their relationships. And Paul is thankful for that. He's thankful because the gospel is popping up all over the world and changing lives. Not just here, there, but everywhere. He's thankful uh, for Epaphras because Epaphras has done a great job in preaching the gospel, sharing the good news, discipling people in the faith, establishing them in it. Great job. He's thankful because they've entered into a partnership with him for the sake of the gospel. And he's confident that God's going to continue the work that he's begun in them. That's what Paul's thankful for. And then he says, this, for this reason, since the day we first heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. And then he explains what he prays. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. Paul prays that they would be filled with knowledge of God's will. Now, when we think about God's will, the framework we put that in when we're praying, Lord, help me know your will, we're thinking about left or right choices. Often when we pray, God, What's your will? What should I do? It's in a left or right, like lifestyle choice. Lord, should I apply for QUT or UQ? What's your will? Lord, should we buy that house or that house? Lord, what's your will? Lord, should I ask her to marry me or should we break up? Lord, what's your will? When we pray for God's will, often it's about lifestyle choices. It's about left or right. It's about prosperity in our lives or the right path. And so that transfers when we pray for other people. Often our prayers, Lord, may they know your will, is about helping the ones that we love make the right left or right choice. Lord, help them decide whether they should choose that subject at school or that subject at school. Lord, help them decide whether they should put an offering on their house or not, whether they should go into that retirement village or stay at home and have care in home. Lord, help them decide to make the right choice. May they know your will. For us, it's about lifestyle choices, career choices, moral choices, financial choices, relationship choices. But what we find when we read the Bible is actually 
Um, knowing God's will has much less to do with left or right lifestyle choices and much more to do with obedience. Know it so you can do it. Right? Let me show you some, um, some verses. Uh, in Psalm 143, the psalmist doesn't say, teach me your will, but teach me to do your will. In other words, action. Not just uh, understanding or insight, but action. You can't separate knowledge of God's will from obedience to God's will. Jesus, again, makes this clear in Matthew 21. He tells a parable to help people understand what it means to know and do the Father's will. Matthew 21. What do you think? There was a man that had two sons. He went to the first son and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which one of these two did what his father wanted? And everyone goes, the first son. The one who said no and then did it. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you still did not repent and believe him. And Jesus is saying, you say you know God's will. You say you know God. You say you have the knowledge of God, yet you never take action. You've separated knowledge and obedience, and I always put them together. And this is what Paul is praying, and it comes out really clearly when you see the link between verse 9 and verse 10 in, uh, in this passage. Let's have, a, let's have a good look. And if you're, if you're the kind of person that takes notes or highlights your Bible, I would highlight verses 9 and 10 because Paul links together very clearly. We pray that you would know his will and that would result in action. Let's take a look. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, that you would know God's will and you would do it. Puts them together. Part A, part B. One leads to the other. That you would know God's will and do it. So when we pray for the ones that we love, our prayers should be more than just, Lord, thank you for them, protect them, bless them, amen. Or Lord, help them make good decisions, relationship decisions, moral decisions, financial decisions, career decisions. Like, oh, that's great. Pray for that. But it's more than that. It's beyond that. The heart of our prayer for knowing God's will is obedience. Lord, help them to know it and to do it. And may we never separate one from the other. Help them to know it and to do it. Now this means that sometimes it's going to be tough because doing God's will can be costly. You know, about a month ago, I was in the Garden of Gethsemane in Jerusalem and we stood there amongst the olive trees and we read the scriptures of Jesus agonizing over the cost of doing God's will. And I'm so grateful that he didn't just think about going to the cross, but he did it. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross because he loves us so much and wanted to please the Father. He agonized over it. It's costly. So when we pray, Lord, may they know your will and do it, sometimes that's tough. Um, a few years ago, Hans Peter Royer was uh, in uh, Brisbane for an Easter conference and he told a story there that's always stuck with me. And it's a story of a Second World War um, army chaplain from America. And this chaplain is on the front lines in France, you know, right in the thick of the action amongst the soldiers representing Jesus in those places. And he writes a letter back to his 10-year-old son. And he writes to his wife and he says, please share this with our son that he might know how to pray for me. And this is what he says. He says, the first prayer I want my son to pray for me is not, Lord, keep my daddy safe. 
but rather, Lord, make my daddy brave and make him strong if he, had, if he has hard things to do. Son, right and wrong don't matter, but life and death do. A daddy dead is daddy still, but a daddy dishonored before God is something too awful for words. And I know you would like to put in something about safety, and mother would like you to, but put it in afterwards, always afterwards, for it really does not matter as much as doing what is right. Isn't that powerful? He says, don't, don't pray for my safety. First of all, pray that I would know and do God's will, even if it kills me, even if it's costly, even if it's the ultimate price. What matters most to me is that I would be obedient to the things that God is calling me to. Yeah, yeah, pray for safety. That's fine. Pray for safety. I pray for safety every time my 14-year-old son leaves the house. I'm like, Lord, as he rides his mountain bike, as he, him and his friends build those jumps, may someone have the first two zeros dialed, just in case there's an emergency. Protect him, keep him safe. But always afterwards, for it really doesn't matter as much as doing what is right. I think that army chaplain is onto it. I think we should pray, Lord, may they know your will and may they do it. Obedience. May they know your will and may they do it, even if it means that they end up poor. Even if it means that they're sick and suffering. Even if it means they don't get the promotion, they don't get the girl, even if it means they end up out of favor with the people that everyone else is trying to please, even if it means they don't make the team, they get rejected or bullied, even if they don't get ahead of the pack, even if they don't have the life they've always dreamed of, Lord, may they know your will and do it. Now, this is tough. This is tough because sometimes you find yourselves in those moments where you're discerning, Lord, what should I do? And you realize that there's a cost to obedience. I remember um, in 2004, I was a high school teacher at Northside Christian College. And uh, halfway through the year, uh, one of the teachers I worked with was married to the youth pastor at Inaugura Baptist. And um, she came to me and said, hey, um, Sam's gonna be finishing up. Uh, I know you're really keen on ministry and very involved in your church. I think you should start praying about whether or not the Lord wants you to leave teaching and become the youth pastor at Inaugura Baptist. And uh, Don McPherson was the senior pastor at that time. And uh, we started talking and praying together and discerning what the Lord was doing. A few folks here from the Inaugura side of those days and a few from the North side side as well. So it's interesting. And I remember partway through the discernment process where I realized, oh man, I'm stuck. Like if I go to the school, the 120 students that I teach, just yesterday I found a stack of cards that they gave me when I left, spoiler alert. And some of them were like, oh my goodness, Mr. West, I can't believe you left us. We're so devastated. We're so mad at you. And others are like, you're going to be a great youth pastor. We're excited for you. I remember thinking, oh man, there's 120 kids I teach and, and their parents, of course who want me to stay. They want me to see out the whole year. They'll probably want me to stay next year, two and the year after. And I thought, oh, if I go into ministry, if I'm obedient to God's leading, I'm gonna be devastating all these people. 20 years later, some of them have only just started talking to me again, right? It was tough. But on the other hand, I remember thinking, oh man, I'm falling in love with the people of this church. And I've got like this for you, for them, right? I want to see them grow in faith and got a relationship with a bunch of them still all these years later. I remember thinking, if I stay at school, I'll be shattering the hopes and dreams of this group of people who want me to come and minister to them and, you know, be part of the family. I remember just thinking, this is so hard, Lord, but obedience is costly. In fact, I remember one day, one of the senior staff at the school came to me and said, Mark, I've just heard that you're going to be leaving partway through the year. And she, she said to me, how can you possibly think God is in this? How can you possibly think he's going to honor this and bless you in this decision? Like, this is a bad call. You're not discerning God's will. But as we talked and prayed and 
I'm grateful for Don and his leading in this as well. And as it was affirmed through the Holy Spirit and many, many people, it became clear that that's what God was calling me to do and that obedience was the next step. So I was obedient. I left partway through the year. It was very painful and costly. And I look back at that now and I realize that God was teaching me the cost of obedience. He was saying to me, Mark, you want to keep everyone happy. You want everyone to like you. You want everyone to be, wow, you're a great teacher. Wow, you're a great pastor. We're so grateful for you. And you can't always do that. And he was teaching me that, he was asking me the question, are you going to be obedient to the things I'm calling you to, even if other people think you're making a bad decision? If other people think you're not being obedient to God, are you still going to seek me first and do what is right? To be obedient to what I want you to do. And I'm incredibly grateful for that season in my life. I learned a lot about obedience, and and God's really blessed that. And again, I'm grateful for Don for his prayers and discernment in that. I know many other people were praying for me too. You know, my parents, my mentors, my close friends, uh, my wife. And people were praying, oh, not Lord, make make Mark really happy or help him find his sweet spot. You know, he's a pretty good teacher, but he might be an even better youth pastor or, or vice versa. I was grateful that there were people praying, Lord, may he know your will and may he do it. May he know your will and may he do it. Paul goes on to describe what that looks like, what the obedient life looks like. Uh, Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, that you may have great endurance and patience, giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people. Four quick things. First of all, a fruitful life. Secondly, a growing life. Thirdly, a life of patient endurance and a life of joyful thanks. First of all, a fruitful life. Paul says, when you know God's will and do it, It's a fruitful life. You bear fruit in every good work. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are a producer, not a consumer. So you live a fruitful life. If you're a follower of Jesus, your net score, to use Henry's analogy, is plus. It's positive. In other words, you're contributing more to bless people and honor God than you are taking from them. You're a producer. It's a fruitful life. So you have to ask the question, you look around and you say, am I bearing fruit in my life as I'm obedient to Jesus? Where are the good works? Where does my money go? Where does my time go? Am I investing in people? Am I bearing fruit? Am I making disciples? Am I doing good works? It's a fruitful life. Secondly, it's a growing life. Growing in knowledge. Now remember that knowledge is much more about relationship than information. So to know God is less about information about God, facts and figures, and more about an experience of God, a relationship with God. Um, Jonathan Edwards, in one of his writings, um, says that just like there is an infinite difference between being told and believing that honey is sweet, and tasting the sweetness of honey, like you guys like honey, right? So it is that an infinite difference between um, being told and believing that God is love and experiencing the love of God. So growing in knowledge, a growing life is about growing in relationship with God, experience of God, intimacy with God, being closer with Him. And if you're married, you understand that growing together is about intimacy. Fruitful life, a growing life. Thirdly, a patient and enduring life. A life where we don't give up because it takes time. A life where we don't give up because things are tough. A life where we don't quit halfway through the race. A life of patience and endurance. This is why many of the metaphors used for the Christian life are agricultural metaphors which take time. Planting, watering, reaping. It's like three to six months, 12 months or longer. If you've ever grown a pineapple, 
You know, it takes 18, year, 18 months to two years to grow a single pineapple. It's slow. So patience and endurance. And lastly, a life marked by thankfulness to God. Thankfulness to God. I love his last two verses where, where Paul says, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us out um, into the kingdom of his son, the son whom he loves and whom we have redemption, the fullness of life and forgiveness of sin. Paul says, he's rescued us from darkness and brought us into light and life. We were prisoners and now we're free. We were um, lepers and now we're royalty. We were slaves and now we're princes, you know. And every time we stop and think about Jesus, we should well up in thanksgiving and gratitude for the cross. May we never become laissez-faire with the cross of Christ, but may it always lead to joy and thankfulness. So when you pray for those that you love, May you pray, Lord, may my son, my daughter, my wife, my mother, my brother, my friend, my neighbor, may they know your will and may they do it. And may that lead to a fruitful life, a growing life, a patient and enduring life and a life that honors and thanks Jesus for what he's done. So I want to give us a moment just as as a team come back up now to actually practice that, to, to pray that. I want you to think of just, just one person. Maybe you're sitting next to them now. Maybe they're downstairs. Maybe they're at home and they go into night church later. Think of someone, it's one person who's on your heart and you think, oh, I want this for you. God wants this for you. And I wanna, I'm gonna just lead us in prayer. And we're just gonna pray as you think of that person and their life situation, the things swirling around them, that you would pray, Lord, may they know your will and do it persistently and faithfully. Can we pray together? Lord, I thank you for the richness of your word. Lord, I thank you for this incredible passage of scripture. Oh, Lord, there's so much in it we didn't even touch on today about the hope of glory about the work of Christ, about the activity of the Holy Spirit and the power of the word of God. Lord, there's so much in this passage. But Father, we just want to hone in this morning on those middle verses that tell us when Paul prayed for the church, we call us, say, Lord, the Colossians, that he prayed that they may know God's will and that it would, would result in a life that pleases him in every way. So Lord, now we we want to lift up to you. We want to bring to your throne of grace, Lord, our loved one. Lord, you know them. You made them. You dreamt them up before eternity began. You know every hair on their head. You've ordained every day, Lord, and written it in your book, the book of life. There is nowhere that the one that we love can go where you are not. They go down to the depths, you are there. They go to the highest place, you are there. They carried on the winds of the the waves, Lord, you are there. You're inescapable. So Lord, you love them and you know them. Lord, and now out of all the things we could pray for them, Lord, we pray that they would know your will, your good and perfect will and that they would do it. That what you have revealed, Lord, in your scripture, in your gospel, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, Lord, that they would capture and captivate their lives. And it would would result in obedience, a commitment from the one that we love to live a life that pleases you in every way. even if it's costly. Lord, and as they do that, that they may bear fruit, the fruit of righteousness, gospel fruit, good works. They may grow in their experience of you, Jesus. 
They'd be close with you. They'd know your presence in their lives, intimacy with you. Lord, they'd be patient and endure. It's a marathon, the Christian life. It's a race we run until our last breath. And that it would well up in thanksgiving. I just want to give you just a, a minute before we worship together just to, to pray, to intercede, to give thanks for and to intercede for the one that you love is on your heart this morning.